Well, welcome to Centerpoint um, and uh, our authentic experience here. Last week, we started a series called Being There. And like Christian talked about already, there's moments in our life where we connect with somebody because of a common experience. And uh, we started last week with the idea of control and inviting God into that space of surrendering. We don't have control over all the outcomes in our life, but we do have the control to surrender. And so by surrendering, we invite God into the process like we sang about this morning. Um, We invite God into the process to work from a place of knowing that God holds all things and, can, can, and has the outcomes in his hands, rather than trying ourselves to work for control in our lives. So we started there last week, and, and, and then we looked at a story of Jesus's where on the night before Jesus dies, and we're going to look again at, at, uh, at the same, a uh, different part of the story, but the same story. On the night before Jesus dies, he, he prays this prayer, and he's about to go to the cross, and it's, it's brutal, and there's He's about to suffer, and he's been betrayed by some of his closest friends. As a matter of fact, all of the people in his life except for his mother and a few other followers that he had, including John, are at the cross when he dies. But everyone else leaves him, and eventually he's in a grave by himself, which we're going to look at today. But he prays this prayer, and he says, God, I don't want this to happen in my life. And maybe you've prayed this at some point before. Maybe you've been there too, where he says, I don't want to go through what I'm about to go through. And would you take this cup from me? I mean, I don't want a drink of this. I don't want a part of this. And, but he prays this powerful line at the end. And he says, but not my will, but your will be done. And so we've all been there in these moments in our life where we don't really want to go through the thing we're going through. And Jesus gives us this template to surrender. And so we're going to jump, use this as a springboard and jump off this concept of control. Because once we say, God, I surrender to you and I give you control, there's this part in our story. And everybody's faith journey has this season in it. Some are longer, some are shorter. But there's moments in our story where God seems to be silent. It's almost as if he's not working or he's absent or we feel abandoned. And we ask ourselves this question of, God, why are you so slow? Like, why is God so slow? I mean, it would make so much more sense if God would just be fast because I have this need or I have this want or I have this desire or I see things a certain way. And so, God, why are you taking your time? And in the same way, Jesus last week says, I've been there when it comes to surrender and control. Can anyone else hear the kids yelling right this morning? Yeah. You ever wonder if they're having a good time? Well, they're having a good time. Thank you, Mary. But in the same way that Jesus said last week, I've been there when it comes to surrendering control. He's going to say, I've been there too when it seems as though God is absent, which is a challenging part of our story, but is an important part of our story. And it's an important part of a healthy faith journey because we all face pain. We all have challenges we need to endure. And Jesus has been there. And if you don't like waiting... You're coming right alongside me because patience is one of those parts of my story that I struggle with too. I mean, I drive home and for some reason, Langley Township, probably the new mayor, thought we should do all road construction in a three-week window right before school starts. (laughs) You know, because parents don't need to get to school. It's not stressful to get them to school, so let's do it then. And let's make sure we only do it between the hours of 7 and 9 a.m. And when school end, oh yeah, and then from 2 until 5, and then we'll break in between those times, right? You see where I'm going. Now, they don't do this, and I know I'm being hard, and you're like, do you not like construction workers? I'm not saying any of that stuff, okay? I'm not trying to make a statement other than sometimes the planning is a bit poor. But I wait in the line, right? And I'm sitting there. And the lady's holding the stop sign. And if I'm a few cars back, I generally have a little bit more patience than if I'm the first car. 
Because I'm like, could I have squeaked it out? Could I have just like pushed a little bit harder and, oh, I didn't see your sign, sorry, and drive through, you know? But when you're at the front of the line, you're like counting the cars coming past you, they like cut it down to one lane and you see them coming past and you're like, is there more cars coming through than cars that went our way? And you see, begin questioning everything. And oh, you know what? This person holding the sign. Oh, you know what? They have, they have a problem with, with, with people. That's what their problem is. And so they're holding me up because this is their chance to have authority, right? And they're like, no, you're not going to go. And you know, you play all these games in your head when you wait. And we all get, we've all been there, right? We've been held up in traffic or in a grocery line. If you've ever been to Costco, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And when it comes to waiting, particularly when it comes to waiting and when it comes to our Heavenly Father, it's easy to think that in the waiting, the God's not working. But all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout the New Testament, in a period of time that we're going to look at today, God is working. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, one of the Old Testament prophets who foretold Jesus' death and, and explained what was going to happen in his story, this is what the prophet Isaiah actually writes. He says, For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you. And then he writes this line, and I find this fascinating, who works for those, what? And none of us love this line. As a matter of fact, some of us just avoided this line, or maybe it just we didn't underline this in our Bible because it used the word wait. But who works for those, what, who wait for him. And there's something in the waiting that God produces in us. But it still doesn't answer the question of why does God take so long. But I'm going to outline three different reasons why I believe God might be taking his time. And I'm not God. I don't understand all God's ways. Two are helpful, and the third one is just difficult. I'll be upfront with you on that. But I think these help us to understand why there might be a process. And the first is this is that maybe if it's, not re- if it's not ready, maybe God is working on it. Now, there's this period of time between the Old and the New Testament. It's between the end of the book of Malachi and the beginning of the stories of Jesus as outlined in the book of Matthew. Now, there's this 400-period window between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they've been deemed the silent years. And I think aptly so. And the reason that they are called the silent years is because God doesn't speak the way he did during the Old Testament through a prophet or through a judge or through a person of God. We see none of that. So God doesn't speak the way he normally does. And so the people of Israel for 400 years hear nothing. There's just radio silence. And from the outside looking in, you'd say, well, if there's radio silence, then maybe God just isn't working. But what the intertestamental period, this 400 years, or silent years, would tell us is that just because God feels silent doesn't mean that he's absent or that he's not at work. As a matter of fact, there was four key parts of the intertestamental or silent years There's four key elements that took place that set the stage for something so much bigger. As a matter of fact, the reason that we exist today is a result of four of those things that took place during that period of time. And so for us, what we would like is to have the exact package answer that we understand. But when you think about a 400-year period of time, our lifespan is between, uh, the average lifespan is 82 years or 84 years if you're a little bit older or different. Uh, I think women live longer than men. Uh, so somebody cheered on them. Sure. Okay. So, but we have about an 80-year period of life. Well, uh, in, in, the, in the ancient world, the, the, this, the lifespan was about 40 years. So... If you think about that, that would have been 10 generations of people that had come and gone. Think about that, that God was working through 10 generations. And you'd have to wonder if God was silent for 400 years. There's a lot that can happen or not happen in that period of time. But here's the four things that take place during this time. And the first thing that happens is this. Can we get that up on the... 
is that Alexander the Great has a conquest. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the political nature of this, but what takes place is Alexander the Great, as a result of him conquesting, the whole known world at the time began to speak Greek. And this was significant because it meant that there was a common language spoke by a common, common people, and it meant that, that uh, ideas could be transmitted much quicker. And Rome was conquered, and many believe that Rome was conquered, uh, conquered Greece militarily, but Greece conquered Rome culturally. And what they mean by that is that really uh, Greece was the one that set the culture. And so even though the Romans came into power, that Greece had set the stage for the Romans to take their power. Because culturally they had created again this common language amongst many other things. But the second thing that piggybacks off of this that's happening in this intertestamental time or these silent years, which I believe that there is more at work, is that the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. And this was significant because everybody in the known world at the time had access to the Old Testament texts. As a result, it set the stage for if there was somebody to come, per se, like a Messiah, the Son of God, who was to show up on the planet, then there would have been an opportunity for uh, the Old Testament, because it was translated, to be connected to what God had already been at work doing. And so Alexander the Great conquers, and then the Hebrew scriptures are translated into Greek. And so people are saying, well, God's still silent, but God is still working, and I want you to see what happens Next. And what happens next is the Maccabean War. Now, this is a significant part in history. What happens is um, there's been a change of power from Alexander the Great, and eventually there's a, a Seleucid king, and his name is Antichus. And Antichus, what he does is he bans Judaism in Judea. And then he sells off the priesthood. Now, I just want you to imagine this for a moment. What happens, it would be like somebody overtaking the Catholic Church and then selling off the papacy. That's what happened when Antichrist took, took over power. Now, what happens in this, this moment is it, that there's Judeans that are upset the priesthood is sold off to a guy named Jason. Now, if your name's Jason in here, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person, okay? But it gets sold off to Jason. And it starts a Maccabean war. And there's a, a guy that emerges, and his name is Judas Maccabeus. And he has a really cool name. Eventually, his name becomes Judas the Hammer. Oh, yeah, okay? But Judas the Hammer is so upset because what takes place is not only is the priesthood sold off, but Jason allows Antichus to walk into the center of the temple and make a sacrifice to Juice, or Zeus, Juice, whatever. <laughs> it's a new god, it just made him up, Juice, okay? <laughs> Zeus. And what takes place is Judas gets upset and a revolt takes place. And what happens is that Judas takes back Judea and rebuilds the temple. And what happens as a result of that is the Israelites, are, they flood into different nations. But when Judas takes back the temple in Judea, Jews begin to flood back into Judea. And so all of a sudden we have a common language we have, a, uh, we have the Old Testament that is available in Greek to all people. We have Jews who are flooding back into Jerusalem. And then we have this part that maybe you feel is insignificant, but is quite significant, in that Romans take over and they start building roads. Now, this is pretty wild, and I want to just show you a map for a minute. And what happens is that all these roads are getting established during this just uh, about an 80-year period. And as a result of this, there's uh, 29 highways that are created, 250,000 miles of road that was laid, and 80,000 paved miles. It was the most intricate highway system at the time. This was significant. Because there's times in our life where we believe that God is silent and we equate that to not working. 
And in this 400-year period, every scholar says that it was the first time in history that three things took place. The first was this. It was the first time in the history that people were encouraged to ask questions as a result of the Seleucids taking over. The Seleucid method was taken place and it replaced the didactic method, which meant you would go from just getting information, believe in God, and they go, okay, I'll believe in God, to beginning to ask questions. This opened up the door to questioning why, what is truth, to being able to question why do I believe what I believe and why do I follow the gods that I follow? People were encouraged for the first time to ask questions. The second thing is this, is that everyone had access to the Bible in a language that they understood. The third thing is this, is that the good news could spread in a common language to the Jewish people to the entire known world. And what is deemed as the silent years actually was a preparation period for Jesus to come. Many scholars believe that it was the perfect storm for a message to be unleashed on the world. And when the right time came, as we celebrate every Christmas, God sent his son in God's perfect timing. And just because God is silent doesn't mean that God is absent or that he's not working. It doesn't mean that he's ignoring you or he's neglecting you. It doesn't mean that he's forgotten his promises for you. Maybe it's not ready yet. Maybe God is working on it. And while you're waiting, God works. As Galatians 4, the author tells us this, but when the right time came, God sent his son. In all the waiting, in all the silence, God was prepping the perfect time, almost the perfect storm for the world to hear the message. So maybe it's not ready and he's working on it. Maybe that's what happens in the waiting. Or maybe it's the second one. Maybe he's working on it. Or maybe the second point is this. Maybe he's working on you. God, why won't you give me what I want? Maybe it's an opportunity for you to grow, or maybe it's something we can't handle. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to grow in stewardship, or maybe it's for us to have the character to be a container for the influence. Maybe we don't have the character to withstand, or maybe... We don't have, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, and this doesn't apply to you, but for followers of Jesus, maybe our first love has grown to be our third or fourth love. And maybe there's a reorientation that needs to take place in us. And God wants to work on us. You see, when I was, when I turned 30, I am just recently turned 40, so a decade ago, I, uh, Destiny and I set out to plant a church. And um, we had a small group that was ready to go, full of passion. And, uh, and I, you know, when I look back, I, I was like so naive. <laughs> and, you know, but there's something about that. There's a beauty that you probably wouldn't do the thing that you're naive about because you, if it was too hard, because you just, don't know and any better, and so you just do it, right? And we, we almost want to get after it. So any of you youth or young adults in the room, when somebody comes with you to you with an idea and tries to discourage you because it's hard, you need people in your life that see what is in you and calls out the gold in you because great things take hard work. And just because there's experience doesn't mean it's not worth it. Just because somebody's experienced something doesn't mean it's not what God's leading you into. And so you need people around you. This is why we talk about small groups all the time. Because there's a lot of voices in the world. But at this time, uh, we left our, our church and we were about to start a new church. And there was this period about a year, 13 months of waiting. And I remember in the waiting that I'm... I, uh, 
I, w I was, I just started my graduate studies, and so I was on, doing online school, and we had this plan of Destiny going back to work, and she would work for a year before we planted the church, and I'd raise money, and uh, or we, we, as a team, we'd raise money, and, and then we'd, we'd get a launch team, and then we'd work from there, and we'd begin to build, and we'd grow, and all those kind of things. And so there's this period of waiting. And when we launched, we, we got a green light, and then about three months in, we started getting red lights, and not because of character or competence even. There was just some things that came up that were being red lit, and it was like, we get a green light and then red light. We get a green light and then red light. And then on top of that, about four months in, I left my, uh, December 2013, I left my position, and then in January and April 2014, uh, we had three kids at the time, and Destiny and I had this whole plan mapped out. We found out that Destiny was pregnant. Now, th there's nothing wrong with that, but it was just, we had this plan, and we tried to figure out, well, if she's pregnant and we're supposed to be planting a church, well, does that mean we're not supposed to plant the church? Like, this wasn't part of our plans, and so we're waiting, and we're like, wait a minute, she's not going to be working. The plan was that she would work, and then we weren't sure about my wage, you know, and so we had this tension of, well, can we still do this? And then not just that, but we were getting red lights and green lights, and, and then it felt like we weren't, we weren't getting the traction that we had hoped for, and we had the passion, and we had all the, the heart in the world. But there were so many months of waiting. And I remember in the waiting thinking, God, are you in this? And somebody asked me, Josh, have you ever been 100% sure that God was in something? And I'd say, yes, post-event. 90%. That's about as high as I've gotten. And maybe in that year, as low as 0%. No, that wasn't that low. That's, that's too much. Being dramatic. <laughs> but I remember sitting there in the waiting and saying, God, you know, is this for me? Is this for us? And you might be in a time of waiting right now, but there was something that God needed to do in me. I need to, to recognize that there's certain things that I can't force forward. There's certain things that I can't just manufacture or manifest. There's things that only God can produce in me. That's why he's, he tells us that there's these things, they're called fruits of the Spirit, which is super weird. If you're new to faith, you're like, fruits of the Spirit? What is this? Grapes and pineapples? What are we talking about here? But fruits of the Spirit are things that grow out of us, a result of what God does in us. And in my time of waiting, in the times when God has felt silent or dark in my life, God has produced the best things in me. The more that I draw close and the more that I wait and the more that I lean in, that God has done something in my life and in my heart. And that's the story of many of you. That it wasn't in the easiest times, it was in the times of darkness that God did something in us. So I want to say this, that in the waiting, don't waste the waiting. If you wait passively, it won't produce in you what God wants to produce in you. There's something in us that maybe we don't see it yet, but God still wants us to pursue him and do what he calls us to do. That's why in every season, we invite you to serve on a team here at Center Point Church. That's why in every season, we invite you to be in a small group. That's why in every season, we ask you to invest financially. That's why in every season we, invest, we invite you to invite somebody with you to Center Point Church because we know that these things grow our faith and produce something in us. And maybe you're just not ready yet. And maybe God's working on you. So maybe God's working on it. Maybe God wants to work on you. And I said the third one is challenging. And some of us just don't want to hear it, but I believe as a pastor who preaches the truth and is as authentic as I can be. Maybe God isn't going to do the thing that you want him to do. And you might feel abandoned in that or alone. But this was even true for Jesus. 
As Jesus' disciples have betrayed him, his mother and a few close of her friends or close disciples are at the foot of the cross. He uses the words from a Psalm 22, verse 3, written hundreds of years before by the psalmist David. He, write, he says these words. And when we read them, we think, oh, those are just a feeling, Jesus. No, no, no. When Jesus cries out these words, he is speaking literally. Look what Jesus says, because he'll say, well, I've been there too. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in this moment, Jesus, by himself, he dies and is separated from God in a literal sense. And when Jesus went to the cross, he was abandoned. And everybody abandoned Jesus' only darkness, it says, was his friend. And in that moment, Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself. Jesus took darkness as his only friend that in your darkness, you would know that there was somebody there for you eternally. And Jesus was truly abandoned so that we only have to feel abandoned. We are not abandoned. And when you feel like God is silent, when you feel alone, that you're not seeing the thing that you desire the most, Jesus would say, I have been there too, but I have an answer for you. That in your darkest times, I want you to know that my grace is the most abundant. That I am there with you, I am for you, and I have been there too. And today, you might say, God, I believe you can. You might even say, God, I believe that you will. But my prayer for you, and I believe Jesus' desire for you as he took sin upon himself on the cross to make a way, Jesus would say, even if you don't, God, I still believe. And my hope is that you would know in that time of darkness or that time where you feel alone, when you feel abandoned, that you'd be reminded that Jesus says, I've been there too, but I went there so that you would know that for all of eternity that I'm with you. That even when it feels like God is silent, that you would know and that you would remember that my sacrifice on the cross for you was made so that you would never be alone again. That anyone who believes in me for all of eternity would be connected to me. And that's the gift that Jesus provides all of us. So why is God so slow? <laughs> well, I believe God has perfect timing, but I believe he's working on it, or he's working on us. But ultimately, even if we don't get the thing that we long for, that he sent his son Jesus as an ultimate reminder that he's always with us. And that's my prayer for you, that you would know that your heavenly Father is always with you. Let's pray. God, I thank you today. I thank you that you are for us and that Jesus, you, you stand alongside us. That even in that moment where we feel like we're alone or we don't see you at work, that God, we'd be reminded that Jesus, you came for us. That you were alone, so we, didn't have to, we don't have to be. That we might feel that way, but Jesus, you want to remind us today that you're with us. That even in the waiting, that there's something you want to produce in us. That even in the waiting, that you're still working. God, remind us of that today. And sometimes we have the blinders on, or sometimes you've been disappointed or we have unmet expectations, but God, I pray that you'd meet us here. For those that 
feel disappointed or for those that feel alone, that God, they would be reminded today that you are with them. God, thank you for the reminder that Jesus, that not only did he die, but he rose again so that we might know you. So God, we thank you for that today. We thank you that you're with us. We thank you that you're for us. Encourage us, inspire us today, we pray. Amen. I hope you have a fantastic week. We're going to continue part three next week of Been There. And we got some coffee in the foyer. We want to encourage you to hang around for a little bit. But we'll see you next week at Centerpoint Church. Invite somebody to come sit with you. And we hope you have an amazing week.